Private John D. Clemente, United States Army, World War II. I interviewed John in Nashua, New Hampshire. It was December the 3rd, 2008. I was in New England doing a lot of interviews that time with World War II veterans and uh, just a great memory there. Uh, we lost John in 2021 at the age of 96, but his story lives on, folks. It's a great one through his eyes and ears. We're going to learn more about World War II today. John served with the 1st Army in World War II as a rifleman, a gunner, a machine gunner, and was a communications man, a lineman, and worked with a 91 millimeter mortar uh, platoon, too. So he's a very versatile man in World War II. He made the D-Day landing June 6, 1944 in France, worked his way all the way up to Belgium, uh, Bastogne, and at the Battle of the Bulge, folks. And John, one of the most, I think, touching things for me listening to his story was his them liberating the Dachau concentration camp in World War II. If you know your history about the Holocaust, John is featured in my 10th film, Yom HaShoah, The Holocaust Remembered. And he's also featured in my 12th film, The Battle of the Bulge. And these DVDs, by the way, are available on my website uh, at the Honor Store. If you'd like copies of uh, all the films I've done, there's digital downloads or DVDs that can be sent to you. So I, I don't I'll say a lot about that, but John is featured in those two films. And uh, like I said, his story is very enlightening and really gives a great view uh, from his perspective as a young man in World War II. So I'd like to thank Harry Marshall for making it possible for you to watch John D. Clemente's story today. Harry, God bless you. Thank you. Harry's father was a P-47 fighter pilot in World War II, a first lieutenant, and he flew P-47s and just a remarkable man. That was Virgil Marshall, his father. So Harry, thank you. It's great working with you this year. Hope to hear from you again, and I hope you're getting a lot out of these stories and sharing them with your family and friends. Ah, my heart's full, folks. Thank you for watching these stories. Thank you for subscribing to this channel. Thank you for um, just being there. Those of you who have supported this work, God bless you for it. And uh, my radio station, Voices of History Radio, do I talk about it enough, folks? It's been on the air now almost a year. Over 50 countries so far have tuned into this radio station. I'm just so proud of it. All the stories you see here on the YouTube channel are on the radio station 24-7 around the world. I've got people all over the world listening. It's really encouraging for me to, to hear from you. And um, let's just keep these both of these platforms going, folks. Let's keep them going strong this year. Like I said, I appreciate your support. And um, just share these videos and subscribe to this channel. And let's just honor John D. Clemente by watching his story. And I want to hear from you. Send me a comment. Some of you are, haven't commented. Send me a comment. Let me know what you think of this channel and these stories as they continue to come out, folks. This is a labor of love. I've been doing this 21 years now. At times it's very tiring, but it's, it's, it's worth the effort. If the cause is great enough, it's worth the effort. As we continue to stand up in the day that we live in and fight for our veterans, folks, fighting for the same freedoms in our own country that they fought for in foreign soil. That's 2024 as we go ahead into another election year. So if you want to hear more about that, I have another YouTube channel called God's Underground. You can listen to that. I will go into some more of the things that I won't hear. But I know a lot of you have followed me there too. So all right, that's it for now. Talk to you soon. God bless you. drafted I wanted to volunteer to the Marine Corps when Pearl Harbor got attacked but I was colorblind they wouldn't take me. Is that right? Nobody would take me but the Army says when you're ready we'll take you. Do you 
remember where you were during Pearl Harbor and hearing the news of the attack? Were you in school or do you remember that time? I think uh, I was around the corner talking with the boys. I didn't even know what, what Pearl Harbor was. None of us knew. Mm -hmm. But we found out later on during the day what it meant. So right away all of us were eager to, to go in. I was 16 at the time. And of course I went down. They didn't know I was 16 years old because I was big for my age. So when they put me, the coloring books in front of me says, you're colorblind. I said, what's the, what's the difference, colorblind? I said, as long as I can shoot and kill somebody, that's all you're interested in. So, so 43, you went in? Went in 43, went into Fort Eustis, Virginia, mm -hmm. for well, 13, 14 weeks. Then I got transferred to Fort Meade, Maryland for a month. Then I went to Camp Kilman, New Jersey, Port of Embarkation for a couple of weeks, and then we boarded the Queen Elizabeth and sailed across the Atlantic. So were you gung-ho at the time? You ready to go? Uh, I was. I was at the time. Mm -hmm. I was stationed in England uh, oh, about three, let me see, got in England November, December, January, February, March, April. So there about five months in, uh, in May, they transferred us to uh, Southampton. So when we got to Southampton, had a little bit of training there, and then they took us on what they call a dry run, a make-a-believe invasion, to see how we would react. And uh, then I realized we're halfway out. They didn't give us no ammunition, no nothing. I says, what the hell are we doing here? He says, this is a practice run. I says, a good thing was a practice run because we fouled up. He says, then I met this guy, uh, uh, Benny, from uh, the West End of Boston. He says, next time we meet John, it's going to be the real thing. Because he came up through Anzio, Sicily, Italy, with the 1st Infantry Division. So the next time we met, I realized before we boarded ship, they gave us bandoliers of ammunition, grenades, and what have you. I said, oh boy, this is it. So halfway across, then uh, we were playing cards, gambling, and singing, and what have you. And uh, then they, they gave us the password for that night for when we hit the beach. I'll never forget it was thunder and welcome. So uh, got halfway across, then about, oh, about 4 o'clock in the morning, we could hear the big battle wagons opening up their guns. I said, oh, Jesus. I said, this is it. So we waited out there until what they call uh, a big rhino ferry came along the LST that we were at. We loaded all our equipment on it, and then they started bringing us in. But as we were going in, you could see the Germans were shelling us. There was one shell that landed in front of us, one landed in the back, and I was waiting for the third one. So I went near the edge of the barge in case that thing ever hit. Either I get blown into the water or I get thrown in the water. But the third one finally never came. But as we got closer to the beach, but when we got off the LST to get out of the Rhino Ferry, they were playing uh, Glenn Miller's music, uh, American Patrol. And I felt pretty good about that until we got closer to the beach. Would you go in on a Higgins boat? No, uh, we went on a Rhino Ferry. It was a barge about the size of a football field. They had all kinds of equipment on it. Uh, we had four 90 millimeter guns on it, uh, all kinds of artillery personnel and what have you. And then they pushed us into the beaches as we were going. We could see the uh, dead bodies along the water. I wanted to stop and help them, but I couldn't. Now, did you go on an Omaha beach? We were scheduled to go to uh, Utah beach. Then they changed their routers. We had to land in Omaha, what they called Bloody Omaha. It was a mess. It was one mess there. I mean, uh, I, I never seen so much death in all my life. I mean, uh, they gave orders uh, for some of them to man the machine guns, and I guess they were all scared inside the, the tractor where we were at, so I went upstairs and uh, manned the machine guns. And uh, when I shot, I don't know what the hell I was shooting at, but I was scared. And the first thing I was thinking about was, Mama, what do I do? She says, uh, I could see my whole life going right in front of me. And I says, what the hell am I doing over here? I said, I don't even know these people. And here I am, we're killing them. For what? But finally, when I got my feet on the ground, I felt better. Then we went up to the top of the hill, dug in our replacements. We had to go in and give the 1st Infantry Division any aircraft support and artillery support whenever they called for it. But uh, the sight of that beach was something that we remembered. It was terrible. It was terrible. Uh, what was your MOS? What was your job in the Army? A rifleman? Or? I was a gunner. gunner. A machine gunner? A gunner, a gunner and a machine gunner. Mm -hmm. I was a marksman and uh, a rifle and a... Machine guns, mm -hmm. but my MO number I was uh, 741. I was a communication man, telephone lineman. Mm -hmm. That's what they trained me for. 
But I had to go where they needed the personnel when I got overseas, so they stuck me into a 90 millimeter outfit, and I told them, I says, I don't know anything about these guns. They said, well, you've got two weeks to learn, and you better learn fast. So they, they, they elected me to become a gunner. And for me to get promoted, I have to wait for the gunner to get killed, then I step into his position, and I get his stripes. I said, it's all right, I'll stay where I am. I didn't want to see any of my men get killed. But we lost a few of them going over, though. So, so that you obviously lost some friends that day. I, th uh, I think I lost about three or four of them at the time. Mm -hmm. I was lucky. I don't know, maybe the good Lord was looking after me, but I kept praying all the time. So what, one of the questions I'll ask people like yourself in combat, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, did you ever feel invincible, like nothing could happen to you, and did that change maybe when the bullets were flying? Or I never thought of it. I never thought. I, uh, after that was, when after I got my baptism of fire, that was my first baptism of fire. Once I got over that, I didn't care. It was just like a job. Get up every day, you got to do your job, and that's it. I said, I'm going to get it, I'm going to get it. No sense in worrying about it, because if you worry about it, you're liable to get it. And if they say you were scared, you're not scared, you're crazy. I mean, I was scared all the time. I had my wits about me all the time. I was, I was careful all the time, being careful where I went, and be careful of snipers that were in the area. But uh, other than that, pulling guard duty and uh, staying on the guns at all times, that, uh, you, you had to keep your wits about you. Sometimes, well, when we hit the beach, I didn't sleep for three days. I don't want to tell you what was in my pants, but, but uh, that's the way it was. What, do you, what gets you through the hard times? Your faith, your training, I mean, a combination of both, or what? I believed in my faith. I prayed to God every night. Mm -hmm. I prayed to him every night when I went. If I got a penny every time I prayed, I would have been a rich man today. Mm -hmm. I went to church as often as I can. Matter of fact, when I realized I killed my first enemy, I went to the chaplain the next day. I told him I had committed murder. I said, what do you mean? I says, well, I killed a German last night. He says, no, you didn't. It's not murder. It's an act of war. So I was all right after that. Then I didn't care after that whether I got it or not. But the only thoughts in my mind is when I got an actual fire, look after mom and dad. Whenever you get bombarded, Germans have dropped the planes over, look after mommy and daddy. I'll be all right. And I just kept my wits about me. I tried not to go crazy. What was uh, your rank? I was a buck private. But during the... Later on in the, uh, I'll get to that when you get to the Battle of the Bulge, yeah. that they uh, wanted to, they passed out battlefield commissions. Mm. I refused it. Mm. I said, I came in with these boys, as I want to go home with them. I said, I don't want to be a lieutenant and bring a bunch of green troops in in the Battle of the Bulge. I don't know what the hell they're doing. So I, I refused a battlefield commission and, it's, uh, and I came home a buck private. Well, we're going to jump around a little bit here, but for time's sake. So D-Day happened in June of 1944. June, uh, June the 6th. Yeah, and as you progressed inland, uh, eventually you're going to be online and you're going to end up uh, at what we call now the Battle of the Bulge. But can you give me just a little history of, of what the Battle of the Bulge was and then your involvement in that battle? Well, when the Germans made that big breakthrough, we were advancing every day. Then we pulled in an area, we bivouacked for the area, set up our guns for any aircraft fire and artillery. And uh, that night, I think it was just December 16th, the shells were coming over. We thought it was incoming mail, outgoing mail. That's, that's ours now. That's incoming. So then we had orders pack up and we're getting the hell out of here. I mean, in those days, everything was a curse, a curse word. They didn't use the English language in those days. And... Uh, because they had two majors. One was from the south who wanted to stay and fight. And one major was from the Medford Mass. He says, we better get out of here. He says, we're outnumbered. They're ragging back and forth. And I says, hey, when you two make up your mind, let me know. He says, I had a, a cinder grenade in my hand. I want to drop it down the barrel of my 90. So when it got down to the mechanism, it burned everything out so the Germans couldn't use it. So finally, they made up their minds. We pack up and go. But as we went, we packed. It was very slow going because it was snowing. We, had a, we went to bed that night and woke up with a foot of snow over us. And uh, they had us going crazy. Now, we passed this town of, of Malmundy. I remember going through there, and as we went by there, they captured, uh, I don't know, a couple of hundred, 150, 200 GIs. And from what I understand, they put them all in the field and they machine gunned them all. And I could have been in that group. I, we got out there just in time. And uh, 
Then the next day, the commander wanted us to take prisoners as of interrogation. So we told the uh, rest of the GIs, and they one thoughts in their mind. He says, no, we don't take no prisoners. So when we come back, he says, how come no prisoners? And when they try to escape, we had to shoot them. And uh, they had us barricaded there, what they could. When I finally realized what the bulge was all about, we couldn't get out. No food was coming in. No uh, supplies were coming in. So we were hunting for jackrabbits or deer or chickens, whatever we could find uh, to eat. And then you had to, of course, you had to be careful. You didn't know where the Germans were. And uh, I went hunting for food. And it was snowing so bad, I lost my way. And I was almost going to sleep underneath the pine trees until the following day. But then I trusted my judgment where my outfit was. And I finally got out of the woods and got to my outfit. And we packed up there and we took off. And as far as I could see and I could remember, you could see the whole United States Army retreating, retreating all over the place. And I said, why don't we just stand here and fight it out? But we kept on going until we got to Belgium. That's when they did, after a few days in Belgium, that's when they decided a counterattack. And finally when they did, uh, the, the, uh, after, uh, where the hell, where am I now? Then we got caught in the bottle of the Battle of Bulge. They finally dropped the uh, paratroopers. They finally came down and relieved us, dropped the supplies and what have you, and uh, that's what bailed us out. When we saw those supplies came, I was glad then I could see the uh, B-17s and the B-24s going over that we were going to get out of there alive. But once we got out of there, you could say the, the war was practically over because I think the Germans used everything they had to make that counterattack. Then somebody told us that that, that counterattack, the supplies we were supposed to get went to the Philippines. That's when they invaded Latte, I guess. And uh, the Germans had the, uh, the benefit of the doubt and took advantage of us. I don't know how the hell they made that breakthrough. That was something yeah. I couldn't understand. Well, John, let's, let's slow this down a bit. Let's talk about the Battle of the Bulge. I mean, December 16th, um, the type, type of fighting you were involved with. Give me, give me a typical day. I mean, the cold, the snow, the Germans. Um, what what you remember about that? The actual fighting that was going on. The actual fighting was going we lost on. Lost many casualties. That yeah, involved. that's because the Germans were shelling us all the time. They kept shelling us all the time, so we counterattacked it with with uh, with artillery that we had. All we had were the nineties. My ninety was a nine ton gun. Fired a big shell. You could fire high explosive, point detonating, or uh, high explosive, point detonating. I can't remember the other one offhand. That's right. And uh, when they called for a uh, call for fire, we'd open up on them. We had to wait for whoever was forward observing for us where they needed the, the, the shells to land. And if there were any tanks were coming by, then we'd use armor piercing shells. That was the other one. And uh, those Tiger Royals, well, when they come, come at you, well, it was like a city block coming at you. They had some big, big heavy equipment. And a lot of GIs went down. A lot of them went down. But we were, I was, far enough ahead of the may where the major hand-to-hand -hand combat was. That was the infantry was doing the hand-to-hand -hand combat. Because we had all the heavy equipment, we had to move back and whenever they needed artillery fire or, uh, on the tanks or the personnel, then they phone us in and somebody would phone us and then we'd open up. Mm -hmm. So you, you were right on the front line, you were kind of back a little bit? Yeah. Or, and you were firing as they would tell you? Firing the gun? Well, I had a, I had a sub Thompson machine gun. I went down when we made the Normandy invasion. I I wanted firepower, so I went down the beach and I picked up a Tommy gun off of one of the GIs and I took it with me. That plus my rifle. Of course, both of those equipment, they tell you to make love to them at night because they're going to save your life. And they used to tell you to keep your rifles clean and keep them from freezing. And a lot of them didn't pay any attention to it. And their rifles froze up on them. My wife used to take mine to bed with me. I used to sleep alongside of it. And uh, it was one of the, working in conditions all the time, all the time. But you, you see your comrades go down, and you can't stop to help them, but there's somebody that'll go by and pick them up. But when I saw what they did to those guys in uh, Melmondy, that was, the, that was the end of it for me. But then after that, we waited, and we kept retreating right after that until we got to Belgium, and we had to wait till we got further routers until we started advancing again. But when we did start advancing again, like I say, the, uh, the war was practically over. Well, let me ask you this question, very important. Um, you were probably around it, but did you ever go in any of the concentration camps and I got, help liberate them or walk through any of them at all? I got to the uh, Dachau concentration camp. The fires were still burning. 
You know, you smell animals burning, and you smell human flesh, it's all together two different odors. And whenever I saw it, Dachau concentration camp, I said to myself, how the hell could anybody do anything like this? I mean, the bodies were piled up, the furnaces are still going. Of course, it was all, the Germans all, all took off. They all took off. And that, that, to me, that was one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. I mean, you've seen uh, Auschwitz and those other uh, concentration camps, but when you're right there and you see it, it's altogether different than when you see it on the film. It has a different reaction on you. I mean, I cried all the way through. I was saying to myself, I'm a, I can't use the language that I used then, but uh, it was awful. It was awful. Kids, women, men, stripped naked, burnt naked. And it, it was terrible. It was terrible. I can only imagine, man. I mean, I've, I've talked to some men that have been to the concentration camps, and, uh, and you're describing exactly what they saw, and, and it, it made a, a lifelong impact on them. Well, there isn't a day that doesn't go by in the six to five years that went by that I don't think about it. There's always some thought that's in my mind at all times. Like I said to my wife, I says, uh, 65 years has gone by so fast, it's unbelievable of what happened 65 years ago, and I can, and I can still remember to the day. Now, if she asked me what I did last month, I forgot, I don't know. But that, that, stuck, that stuck in my mind. You said the weather, you thought you were going to die. The weather, the weather was so cold during the Battle of the Bulge that I was, I was afraid of getting frostbitten feet. Because once you get frostbitten feet, then I'm thinking, hey, they're going to start chopping your toes off. I said, I didn't want that. So I kept changing my socks. I, you couldn't dry your socks, but when I took off the wet socks, I put them in my pocket and put on a dry pair. And when those got wet, I took the wet ones out of my pocket and put those on. I kept switching. But, I mean, you wrang all the water out of it. I mean, they say the boots are... Keep your feet dry, but they didn't. But it, it was so cold, they were afraid your, your hands were cold. I went to sleep with uh, all my clothes that they issued me. That's how cold it was. It was bitter cold. I've never seen cold like that in my life, even living over here in New England. It wasn't like that because I wasn't sleeping on the ground over here, but over there you were. You get 12 feet, of, 12 inches of snow falling on you while you're sleeping. You don't even realize it. And you wake up and everything is all white. You know, and then trying to move your guns and that heavy equipment in the, in the snow and try to get it in the marching order. I had to fold up all the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the legs on it. Because mm -hmm. the, the 90 millimeter is a nine ton gun. Mm -hmm. And you had an M4 track that weighed another two tons pulling it. So trying to pull out heavy equipment through the snow was tough. It was hard. Did you sleep in sleeping bags or what? <laughs> Did you have sleeping bags? I had two army blankets. I sewed them all the way around, so I crawled in like a potato sack. But it was tough getting out of it when they, called, when they had, gave you the orders to get up and start firing the big guns. Because while we're sleeping, they holler match pointers. When they say match pointers, we all get up. And trying to get out of that thing in a hurry, that's how I sliced my hand on an old sea ration can I used for an ashtray. I hit that when I got up and I, I bled like a stuck pig. But uh, that's how we had uh, what they call pup tents. You had a, one half guy had the other half, one GI had the other half, and you put them both together, and both just sleep in there. Mm -hmm. I had my experience sleeping with one man next to me, forget it no more. I didn't want nobody to sleep with me anymore. So I went down the uh, beach and I picked up a pup tent off one of the dead GIs and had my own tent all the way through. Then most of the times, you, uh, you try to barricade yourself under a tree someplace in case it snowed. Of course, you dug your foxholes, but my foxholes were so well camouflaged they couldn't find me. And, it, and just covered the branches and snow and stuff, and you climbed right in and tried to get as much sleep as you could, but hoping that you don't freeze to death. But uh, it was cold. It was a bit of cold. Now, when you talked about not being able to help the wounded, I mean, that's just because you were supposed to keep going or the medics would take care of them? Or that's like when we, I got to go back when we hit the beach. When we, when we on this, my rhino ferry, when we went in, I saw all the GIs floating in the water. Says, and then they were all lined up, all covered with blankets and stuff, you know, that, that were dead. I says, Christ, we can stop by and help them. But they wouldn't let you, so you've got to keep going. Says, the, the medics will stay by and take care of them. Only one person I tried to help at the, during the Battle of the Bulge, I walked down this cow path, and he was, the jeep was about 50 yards behind me. And all of a sudden, I heard a big explosion. I turned around, and the jeep got blown on the other side of the bushes. And I went there, and it was Jonesy, and he was, his stomach was... And his face was down the ground, and in the back of his body we had just opened right up. 
And all I did, I went up to him, blessed him, said the name, the name of the Father, and gave the last rites according to my Catholic religion. And they thought I was a priest. I said, no. I said, my religion, we give them uh, last rites. And that night, we're under heavy bombardment. And the kid next to me says, Johnny, teach me how to pray. He was more scared than I was. So after a while, I just took it day for day. I said, if I was going to worry, if I was going to get killed, I didn't have time to worry about it. Wow. So it's, uh, there were a lot, a lot of sites, uh, dead people that were all over the place. That uh, it, it was, It's hard to describe. It's hard to describe. The uh, Battle of Bars, I think we lost more men there than we did on the beach. On the beach, uh, of course, the, the first infantry division went in with the first wave, and then we went in behind them to give them any aircraft support. And, and what I saw on that beach, I said, it was terrible. I mean, after I got over the, the baptism of fire, I was all right. I was ready to fight. Of course, when I, when I get in a, a fight with somebody, my, my, my language is the uh, profanity language. I don't talk English to them. I mean, that seemed, that seemed to, to give me the power when you get mad. Well, that's amazing to me, listening to you and all the stories I've heard and, and just imagining what it would have been like to have been so young and yet to, to experience that. I mean, how, how do you think your whole military experience changed you as a person? Well, I looked at it this way. I went, as a, I went, as a, I went in as a baby. I was only 18 years old. And then I says what the hell am I fighting these people for because I don't know them. But after that engagement was over, I graduated right away. I became a man. You know, you figure, you talk about killing somebody and why are these people doing these things and you try to communicate with them. Of course, with them, they had the Hitler power behind them. But come towards the end of the war, they were using nobody but kids. I mean, I was on guard duty and I seen one the, a German coming down the road with a gun in his hand. I loaded my machine gun on him, and he saw me, and he dropped his rifle and threw up his hands. I could have killed him. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying to myself, well, the war is almost over. As he got closer to me, he couldn't have been more than 15 or 16 years old. Because that was just the age I came in when I was on the uh, Normandy beachhead. So I called the uh, guards down. They picked him up, and they took him back. And for us, all the prisoners that we took, we captured. It's in that commendation. We, got, we captured over 900 prisoners and uh, turned them over to the, uh, to the uh, guards. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think when I came out, I was more educated. I understood what life was all about. You, when you want something, the freedom that we had over in this country and uh, what freedom they had over in, uh, overseas is it to my expectations. I didn't like that type of a freedom. I don't want anybody dictating to me what I gotta do, where I gotta go, and what I gotta say. I want to come and go as I please, and nobody stops me. But uh, generally, when the war was over, I felt good about it. I did my part. I didn't get hurt. The good Lord spared me, and I was thankful for that. And yeah, that's a question I'll ask, is why do you think you came back? A lot of people didn't come back. A lot of them asked me, did you, if you came home as a hero, I said, no. I said, the heroes are over there. They died for me. That's how I felt about it. I mean, I felt bad that we lost so many men and uh, seeing them all laid out on the ground there when we went by. But uh, a lot of them asked me that same question. Do you think you're a hero? I say, no, I'm no hero. I did what I had to do. I like my country. I, I, I'd still go back if I could. Mm -hmm. I want to go back with the Iraq situation. But they say, you're too old to say, as long as I can kill somebody. That's, that's all they're doing over there. That's how I felt about it. But if I had to go back, I'd go back for the sake of my grandchildren, so, so they wouldn't have to witness it. Because I don't think the kids today realize what it's all about. Not when we, in our generation, it was altogether different. They were an eager bunch of boys. Today, they don't seem to care. And that's my opinion. Now, when you went through Dachau, how long were you there? Just a couple hours, or did you stay a day, or what did you guys do? I mean, We were stationed around Dachau for well, probably a couple of days, waiting for orders. Because when you get to a certain point, you drop your guns, uh, put them in the firing position, get everything all ready. So when somebody wanted firepower, they'd call us and we'd open up. Then a couple of days later, we'd move, go someplace else. But when they called us to go around, da I didn't know it was Dachau concentration camp until I got there. When I smelled the uh, 
the, uh, the death all around there. And of course, when you had a few hours that you could walk around to see what's going on, you reconnoitered the position, because I was uh, uh, on the demolition squad. I always went ahead in my outfit to blow open the holes, so when they brought in the big guns, they just moved them right into the holes, and it was already for them. And when I got there, then I walked around the place to see where we were at, and then I finally realized we were right by Dachau concentration camp. I think it was maybe about a mile away from where we were, so we walked over there and uh, finally was, realized what it was. And I went there once and I couldn't go back again. It, it was, uh, I can't think of the word. It was disastrous, disastrous. You wanted to throw, I threw up and you kept saying to yourself, uh, how could uh, Hitler do a thing like this? Of course, Auschwitz was worse. I think uh, Dachau and there was other concentration camps around Auschwitz were small compared to what Auschwitz was. So it's, uh, it was tough. It was, it was hard. I mean, this has been 65 years ago. It's, it's hard to remember, try to remember everything. But that, uh, that's a good question. How could that happen? I, I, that, I don't know if that can be answered. How can a man uh, influence all those people to do those things? It's amazing to me. I don't know. I think... If Hitler had taken his time, he would have conquered the world. And with Alexander the Great, Caesar, and who's the other guy? When try to conquer the world, they got defeated. But my opinion, if Hitler took the time, he would have conquered the world. Now he got as far as the Fr France, that uh, almost uh, annihilated uh, uh, England. It, was, it wasn't for England for fighting back with a few Spitfires they had. Well, then by then, the Americans were sending over our troops and our planes over there too to help fight the, uh, the, uh, the Germans over there. But when we got there, the German uh, planes were, weren't as good as ours. So, but if he had captured uh, England, he would have came here. It's a sobering thought, isn't it? And, and you say to yourself, how can a man like that can take all these people that didn't like the Jewish people or the Jewish faith to burn them all. This is what I couldn't understand. Well, they didn't do nothing to him. So I think, I, I don't know where to toss, what to say about it. All I say is it was a terrible thing what he had done. I don't think he should have did it. Do you guys have to stay in the camp those two days or do you just come and go out of the camp? I mean, I couldn't imagine staying around that very long. I mean, Was that uh, around our gun sites? Well, yeah, did you stay at Dachau? You said you walked around for a couple hours and then... Well, after the uh, guns were all uh, placed in position, some of us would walk around patrolling the area. We'd go out as far as a mile, a half a mile, make sure there was no gun, German gun, gun emplacements around there, machine gunners or snipers and stuff like that. You'd be looking, walking around looking for snipers. And then we got the concentration camp and I realized what it was. You can actually see the ovens were still warm, or what interview said they were. Still they were still warm, warm yeah. Mm. And that's, and I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe how they could put all those people inside there. Unbelievable! I can see uh, roasting a, a a hog or a, or a cow or a, or a pig to to eat, but human beings. Yeah, right. That's a fair. Do you ever ask God why that happened? I mean, uh, that's amazing. People say, "Well, there's a loving God. How can something that bad happen?" What well, you you ask, you ask to yourself, God, why do these things happen? You don't get an answer. You don't get an answer. And you often say to yourself, "Why doesn't He answer me?" So it's, it's something I I was believed taught to believe in God, which I do and I still do. But why do these things happen? I don't know. It's all up to that guy upstairs. I know someday, hope to meet him if I don't go downstairs. Yeah. I think it's a good question. I mean, you know, but, uh, I'm actually going to be working on a story about the concentration camps too. On Friday, I'm going to interview two Holocaust survivors in Maryland for the first time. But I have interviewed this, uh, several dozen men like yourself, uh, the veterans of the Battle of the Bulge, and that actually help uh, liberate the concentration camps and I'm, I'm stunned by some of the things that you saw and you heard and, and then the smell of that it's just it you, says, know, like you said you never forget it it's something you don't want to smell yeah. it's a different smell altogether it was a difficult time talking about it too. and uh, if it wasn't for the uh, Air Force that came over 
and then they, they dropped the supplies and they would have been still there. I would have been buried over there. If they, if there wasn't a break in the sky because it was cloudy and foggy for a whole month, mm -hmm. you couldn't see a hand in front of you when you got up in the morning. Of course, during the Battle of the Bulge, you're talking to a lot of GIs, and then we found out that the signs were all twisted around. And we said to ourselves, we came by here the other day. Then we realized we passed Malmandy and we were back there again. And then they told us some of the Germans are dressed as GIs. You got to be careful who you're talking to. I said, I might have talked to some Germans dressed as GIs. I don't know. Because they, they talked fluent English better than you, you and I did. They knew about baseball, uh, everything. And uh, we might have passed them, which we don't know. Then we got the word that uh, they, they were uh, Germans dressed as GIs. But the only thing a lot of them realized when, it, uh, when an officer goes into combat, he takes his bars off. This one had bars on. And that's how they figured the, was a, what, what, what Germans inflating uh, through the lines. And uh, once we found out who they were, well, we took care of them. But and then they saw a bunch of them trying to sneak by at night that they machine gunned them all. But it wasn't like what they did to our boys in Malmody. I'll never forget that. And I'm saying to myself, I was just left there 20 minutes ago. 20 minutes after I left, they overran my position. But we had already gone. So that was that. I don't remember if I asked you or not, but um, did you lose any friends that were wounded or killed during the bulge? I uh, lost one. And we were retreating. And I told him, well, he didn't get hurt by gunfire. He rode on the, on the barrel of the gun. I said, don't ride this. Says, we hit a hump in the road. You're going to get bounced off. Oh, well, I'll be all right. It came towards morning while we were retreating. I happened to turn around. We hit a hump in the hole, and he, he j bounced off the barrel of the gun and fell on the ground. And two of the rear wheels of the, uh, and the aircraft gun rolled right over him. And he put his hands up because the tractor, the next gun was almost going to, the tractor was almost going to go over him. If that track had gone over, and grind them up like minced meat. Well, probably about three days later, he had died. He came from uh, Brookline, Mass., I think. And I, I, I didn't become friends with anybody that really that close because they tell you, don't get too friend, too friendly with your, your comrades because when they go, you have a different feel afterwards. You know, you have that gut. If uh, you were my best friend, all of a sudden you got shot. I went over. There'd be somebody there waiting to pick you off too. He says, try to not to make too many friends. But that's the way I thought. I never trusted anybody. I mean, you, you trust your comrades. I trusted my outfit because everybody knew what the next man was going to do. That's why I turned down the Battlefield Commission. Once I became an officer, I'd have to lean green troops that I don't know what they can do. But my outfit, if I got hurt, there was always somebody there to take over my, my position. I knew everybody's position, what they had to do. Handler, fuse cutter, gunner, uh, uh, radar control and everything. Because once they match, they call them match pointers, all the four guns match pointers, then all of a sudden all four guns are synchronized by radar. They all move at the same time. Because when they fire, they fire at a diamond pattern. But when you're firing at field artillery, there's always somebody a mile ahead of you, fire for effect to tell you where the shells land and they tell you either right or left or back and forth. Hey. But, uh, you, you mentioned freedom earlier in the interview. What, what? If I were to ask you, what, what does freedom mean to you? I mean, what does that mean to you, John? Freedom to me is to come and go as I please, believe in who I please, and talk to who I please, and say what I want without nobody saying, hey, you can't talk that way. This country, you come and go as you please, with free, uh, free liberty, free speech. Like they, like they said in the Get Gettysburg Address, you come and go as you please. This is a country, you work, whatever kind of work you want to do, Whatever girl you want to go out with, nobody can tell you what to do. That's how I feel. Walking down the street, hi Joe, hi Mary, hi. You got that freedom. But over there, they didn't have it. That's tell me about the, the price for freedom. Uh, what would you tell a young person, maybe, who knows nothing about the sacrifices for our freedoms, to protect our freedoms? You know, what would you say about the price for freedom? Do you love your country? You protect it. If you have to, you give up your life. 
I, I was willing to give up my life so my, well, my brothers were all too old at the time. But for, for the sake of my nephews at those days, I'd die so that they'd be free. Because I knew when we were going to hit the beach, they told us, hey, some of us are not going to come back. So that you have that one thought in mind. And if, you, if you're going to stop to think when you're going to get killed or when you're going to get hit. But to me, that's what, what it was all about. I wasn't afraid to die, by no means. I mean, if this is what I have to fight for to keep America safe from the enemies, I would. What do you tell the kids when you go up to the high school? I tell the kids, a lot of times we go to the high school on Veterans Day, and I always tell them, this is my favorite remarks I made when I ran for class president in high school. Be thankful for what you have today, for tomorrow you may have none. Protect what you have, and appreciate what you have, and fight for what you want. And they, they, they all appreciated that. And then I still feel the same way today. I mean, if I have to, if they would have called me to go to fight again, I'd go. I probably won't move as fast, but I'd go. That's how I feel about it. So, like I said, it's just so my grandkids would have to face the reality of war and hardships like that. It's going to happen one day. It's going to happen again. Yeah. Maybe not in my time, but sooner or later it's going to happen. I mean, it's happening now and over in uh, Iraq there now. God knows where that's going to wind up at. And look at how many boys we've lost over there already for no reason at all. What does the American flag mean and represent to you as a veteran, John? That's a lot of thought. To me, when I see that thing flying, it means freedom for me. You see that flag, you salute it, you wave to it, you thank, and you thank it for it. I hate to see people take the flags and throw them aside and stuff like that. But like they say, every time that flag goes down the, uh, the highway and the, the parade, I always salute it at all times because I belong to the VFW and uh, we preach that all the time. I mean, we help all the veterans that need help, whatever money we collect and funds and raising campaigns and stuff like that. We help the GIs at the uh, hospitals. That's what it means to me. When you see that flag, I know I'm free. When that flag goes down to the ground, nobody picks it up, that's when I'm ready to fight. And I don't care what anybody says. Says, don't try to be a big macho guy. Says, hey, don't talk to me like that. To me, that's freedom. Are you proud that you're a World War II veteran? Damn right I am. Damn right. Proud of everything I did. I mean, I might have did some wrong things over there, but uh, that I wasn't supposed to do, but who, who's to know? But I was damn proud. I was proud when I went in. I was proud when I came home. Have people thanked you for your service over the years? Oh, yeah. How does that make you feel? Great. Well, my son, I went to the uh, World War II Memorial, and I had to bring my son as a guardian. And when he saw the first fella come up to me and says, thank you for your services, my son never saw anything like that, and he cried. He said, Daddy, he said, I'm proud of you. Go. Yeah, that's, that's a good feeling, man. It does. Well, they stop and tell me, of course, uh, when they see the invasion of Normandy and the Battle of the Bulge on the other side of that, mm -hmm. the right away they want to stop and talk to you about it. You know, you, 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 you talk to them briefly of what had happened. He says, it, it was rough, but we managed to come home. But they thanked me for it, pat you on the shoulder and says, thanks again. If it wasn't for you guys, says, we wouldn't be here today. That happens every time I go out, there's always somebody out there to say thank you, which is, which is well appreciated. When you see those old pictures of yourself, what goes through your mind? You say to yourself, you find it hard to believe that you were there, and you're seeing everything, everything's happening all over again. Of course, as I, as, as I watch it on TV, of course, uh, I get very emotional. And uh, it's hard to forget. And you say to yourself, how the devil did I ever get back alive in one piece? Because I see a lot of guys come home with not a leg missing, an arm less, missing, or an eye missing, or uh, some kind of wound that they got. Mm -hmm. But like, I, I must have been one of the lucky ones. I always was careful what I did and where I went. I never went souvenir hunting like a lot of them did. 
And that's how a lot of them got, got hurt, to step in a booby trap. Now, I remember one time, we were, we were in convoy, there was a dead German in the road. I won't tell you what kind of position he was in. The way he looked, the captain says, John says, oh, you move him. I said, I won't move him, that's an otter. So I took a piece of rope, tied around his feet, backed off about 100 yards and pulled him and it blew up, it was, a, it was a booby trap. That's how I was, I didn't trust nothing, didn't trust anybody. Now I stopped my own commander during the Battle of the Bulls. Did you realize who you're talking to? I said, yep. I said, now you advance to be recognized and who's in the Jeep? He's my uh, driver, Jonesy. Now you go back to that Jeep and you walk in front of that Jeep and have the Jeep follow you back in. That's just what he did. And so when he went inside, the boys were telling him, he says, Captain Young, he says, boys, he was glad you're out there on guard duty. He said, John won't let anybody get by. There's a lot of different things that, that happen that people don't realize. Now when we got up on the, on the uh, Remagen Bridge, trying to cross the uh, Rhine, there was a P P P-51 Mustang come over one morning. I was on guard duty, I was on the machine guns. And when the plane came by, I kept circling. Then the second time he went on up, followed him, then he came down. As he was coming down, he didn't dip his wings. To say it was friendly, so I opened up on him. All it takes is one man to open up the machine guns, the whole countryside opens up. They brought it down. He said, who gave you orders to fire? I said, I fired on my own uh, thoughts. I thought it was a German pilot in that plane. And when the plane went down, they went to pick him up. It was a German pilot. Stole one of our P-51s, trying to see what was going on. I says, when the uh, planes come back from the front lines, what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to dip their wings. Well, this one didn't. I said, no, you want to court martial me? Go ahead and cause. I don't care. That's how I felt. I, I did something what I, I thought I had to do. Mm -hmm. Then I stopped another a, a tank commander. He said, do you realize who you're talking to? I don't care who you are. I said, do you realize where, where your barrel is facing? He said, it's supposed to be facing the other way. He says, oh my God. He says, you're right. He says, these are the things I remember when they teach you in the, in the service of what to look for. Because mm -hmm. you talk with other GIs that have been through combat, they tell you these things, what to look for, what to be careful of. And it registered in my mind. And a lot of them, every time we went out on patrol, well, I want to go with John, I want to go with John. And they come at me and say, you don't make no noise. So I mean, there's a lot of different things, a lot of different things I could tell you about it. But, uh, let me ask you this question. Now, I think your wife originally contacted me, but um, read it. There was an article in the paper here locally. Um, did you read that article that was in there about my work, about what I'm doing? Yeah. Or was it your wife that read it? She read it. She started reading it, and I started reading it, which I thought was great. So well, what prompted you to maybe want to talk with me? To let other people realize what, what, what us guys went through and what we did to free this country to let these people come and go as they please. I mean, there was something that had to be done. Of course, I realized in those days, back in the 40s, everybody knew what it was all about. Now, when CBS came down, it was the same thing. They asked me the same questions. I says, I thought it was a great idea. Because there aren't very many of us left. Yeah. They say we're going at a rate of 1,000 or 1,500 a day, and I say to myself, what 1,500 am I in? <laughs> I keep saying that every night when I go to bed. And I thank the Lord for giving me another good night's sleep and getting up the next morning. Well, CBS, they, what they did, they wanted the religious aspect of the war. Okay, and what, John, what did you say to CBS about the religious aspect of the war? What were the questions? What were, they, what were you telling them? What my faith was and what you thought about it. I said, my thoughts were, at the time, I prayed every night I went to bed. And I prayed every time I got up in the morning. And then I said to myself, when I hit the beaches, I says, God forgive me for what I'm about to do. And then I says, Ma. Then I, I could see my whole life fashion in front of me. My mother saying, you be a good boy, you're going to be all right. That's all I needed. And I went to church every time we had Mass. I went to, in the service, we had Mass out in the fields, received communion, we had to. And I even wanted to have Mass for Mother's Day. And when I got to, uh, in Paris, the, at the Notre Dame Cathedral, they had a chance to go to church there too. Every time uh, I, I had a chance to go to church, matter of fact, I got to this place where uh, St. Teresa was born and baptized. Now, what faith are you? 
Um, well, I grew up Catholic, but I go to like the Assemblies of God's Church. All right, the Catholic religion. Well, when she was born and baptized, they know. I don't know if you remember, they had those long stairs. You you kneel down, saying your prayers. Going, up. I was doing that. And the guy, one of the boys, said, "Johnny, what are you doing?" I says, "I'm praying my faith to leave me alone." Because uh, we were about three, four miles behind the lines then, anyway. But our guns could fire eleven miles straight out if they had to. And uh, then when I got home that night, that's the night he said to me, we "We're under heavy aerial bombardment." I said, "Johnny, teach me how to pray." Because these guys were all from the South, Mississippi, Tennessee, Arkansas, because I don't think there was a Catholic faith out, out there in those days. Yeah. But I, I prayed every chance I did, and every night I went to sleep when I could. My famous quotation when I went to bed, I said, Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. That was, that was my prayers for the night. Hey. And that's what you told CBS? Yep. How'd they find out about you? Me. Yeah. The same way. The same way we found about you. It was in the paper. It was in the paper. Yeah. How long ago was that? A couple years ago. I would say. They did just a little story, and they included some of his story in there. Yeah. The same. The same thing you're doing now. Were there other people involved yeah. there too? Yeah. yeah. Like for the evening news, something like that. No, it was for P Channel Five carried it. PBS My or CBS. CBS. Okay. Okay. Great. Because my nephew called it. That's well, great. Johnny, you're on TV. I didn't. I didn't know it. What was the name of it? Um, uh, uh, Lord something. That's great. Did you ever get a copy of it? Yeah, I got the copy home. Yeah. Low flight. That fool. You, you would ask me. No, that's okay. I, I'm. I'm going to check with him. CBS has done some work with me too, so that would be interesting to. Uh, to they see. Went out of Texas. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. The gentleman. Now I gotta go home and pull that thing out, find out what the name of it was. I knew the minute I saw it, I could see the tears come. I, I could feel, feel the tears coming through, and I walked around from state to state of all the uh, pillars that were up. Each one that was marked uh, which state. So I took a snapshot of under New Hampshire, one out of Mass, because I got drafted out of Massachusetts. Then when I got to World War II Memorial, and I saw Normandy Beachhead, Battle of the Bulge, Saint Lowe, Remagen Bridge. The Rhineland, of all the places I've been, I've been in five campaigns, they're all on the bottom there, and I knelt down and I just lost it. I just lost it. I, I couldn't help it. But a lot of people thought I was thrown up in the, in the waters until <laughs> my son come up behind me. And, uh, How did it feel being with those other veterans? You all have a camaraderie about each other? Oh, yeah. We stopped to talk to each one of us where we were, what we did. And I asked a lot of the guys... Uh, when we had that meeting that Friday night before we took the bus trip Saturday, I got up and I says, how many of you have been at the Nominee Beachhead? Four of them raised their hands. One guy went in the same time I did, but he wasn't in my outfit. And, uh, and I says, how many got stuck in the Battle of Bells? Three of them. But I didn't know them. But there were so many GIs, so many different outfits. The, the, uh, the news, uh, news correspondents couldn't actually keep up with all of them. There were too many, too many different outfits. You know, because they claim when they showed us hitting the beaches, I see it on TV. What I was in, somebody said they dropped the cameras in the water when they took some pictures of us going in. Now, whoever took us, I think the Coast Guard was taking the pictures of us when we were going in, they dropped them in the water. They, they, they lost them all. That's why I, I keep looking to see, trying to find my outfit. I said, I got to be out there someplace. I said, I know I got to be out there. John, at the end of my interviews, I always have the veterans give me a salute into the camera. When I when I tell you that was a good practice, go ahead. Hey, look right into the camera. Go ahead again, sir. Excellent. All right.